Hey, Newbie Dan here. This year for Christmas presents, I'm making corn cob skewers. You know, those things you stick in the end of corn on the cob so you don't get butter all over your fingers? I'm making lots of them, in fact. And I'm branding them with the Newbie Woodworker logo because, well, why not? It was my wife's idea, actually. Honest! And of course, I'm putting a food safe finish on them. If that sounds interesting to you, stick around and I'll show you all about it. Here's the blueprints for a skewer, and they're available for free on my website. Or just take a screenshot. As you can see, it's got dimensions in both inches and millimeters. It's shaped like a house, obviously. It's basically a one inch cube with a 45 degree roof. The tines are two stainless steel nails, and one is longer than the other. It doesn't matter what type of nails, as long as they look decent. In fact, this is a finishing nail, and this is a wire nail. Like I said, it doesn't matter. The nails go into a section of hardwood dowel. The dowel gets glued into a hole in the bottom of the body, and a portion of it sticks out below. I found this select pine at my local Home Depot. It's got a nice grain all the way through it, and I thought it'd be perfect for the skewers. It's milled to exactly two and a half inches wide and three quarters of an inch thick. I'm going to have the grain running vertically through each skewer. So the first thing I do is cut the stock down to more manageable lengths. I'll be cutting two inch blanks, so I cut each section to about 24 inches, which is an easy length to handle and a multiple of two inches. For metric users, give yourself about 50 millimeters for each blank and size your sections accordingly. Since the skewers are one inch thick and the stock is only three quarters of an inch thick, I need to laminate two boards together. In order to get the best grain match, I'm splitting each board down the middle, then I'll glue the two halves together. As I'm splitting the boards, I make sure I keep the two halves together, otherwise I kind of defeat my own purpose. Now I'm gluing the boards together. I know this looks like I'm gluing all the boards together, but I'm not. At least I hope I'm not. I'm just trying to make the best use of my space and my available clamps. With everything clamped, I'll wait a couple of hours for the glue to dry. With that out of the way, looks like I did glue some of them together after all. No problem. Famous last words. Hammer time! Actually, it's mallet time. Seriously. Okay then. Fortunately, these sections are much larger than I need, so I can just cut them apart on the table saw. I have to trim them down to the final size anyway, so no big deal. After separating those two pieces, I'm trimming all the laminated pieces down to one inch square. My plan was to leave the seam right in the middle, but I miscalculated, so the seam's off to one side. Fortunately, it ended up looking fine in the end. I'm trimming the ends so they're nice and flush. Now I'm cutting blanks of about two inches. More like around one and seven eighths of an inch to take the kerf into account. I'm making about 50 of them this time through. I might make more later, we'll see. While I'm here, I might as well cut the dowels too. A half inch for each one. Okay, boys and girls, can any of you see what Uncle Danny is doing wrong here? If you said not securing both sides of the dowel, you'd be right. Especially with it pressed up against the stop. Okay, boys and girls, what am I doing wrong now? If you said the same thing, you'd be partially right, but the real answer is that I didn't learn from my previous mistake. Woodworkers who don't learn from their mistakes end up with nicknames like One Eye or Stumpy. This time I'll use an eraser to hold down the other end. Much better. I'm using a three quarter inch Forstner bit, so the holes end up with reasonably flat bottoms for better glue adhesion. I made a center mark on one of the blanks, and I set up my fence and stop so the bit hits right on the mark. And I set my depth stop to what I think is the right depth. 
This one looks good, so I'm ready to go. I move the camera so I don't have to be bothered by it and start drilling. You might not feel comfortable just holding each piece as you drill it, so feel free to set up a clamping system. I'm okay with it though. When you're doing a lot of pieces like this, it's important to check the results every once in a while to make sure nothing's changed. In my case, the Forstner bit moved up in the drill's chuck and the holes got shallower. So I rechucked a bit and I tightened it down a little more carefully this time. When you're using the same bit over and over again like this, make sure your bit doesn't overheat. Take your time and back out a lot to give the bit a chance to breathe. All in all, it took about 20 minutes, give or take. I've got my blade tilted to 45 degrees, and I set a stop lock at 1 inch. Like before, I'm using an eraser to hold the stock, since I don't want to test out my saw stop to break today. I cut one side, flip it over, and cut the other side. You don't have to use a sled for this, but for me, a sled makes it a lot easier. I have a couple of sleds left over from my crosscut sled videos, so this one has been designated as the 45 degree miter sled. I imagine you could make these cuts with a miter saw, but since I've never used one, I can't say for sure. Well, that was cool. Don't you just love woodworking? Let's get this over with before any more cameras get hurt. Now I need to drill the holes in the dowels for the nails. You want the holes to be small enough so the nails don't wobble. In order to figure out where to drill the holes, I want to draw a line across the center of the dowel. So I'm using the center finder tool I got on Amazon for less than $7. I used it earlier when I marked the center of the body for drilling the dowel hole. It can mark the center for round pieces also, but in this case, all I need is a line down the middle. Once I figured out how far in to drill the holes, I made a little jig to help me drill the holes in the 50-odd dowels I have. It's a board with a shallow hole in it the same diameter as the dowels. I managed to get it in the right spot so I could drill one hole, and when I flip the board around, I can drill the other hole. Needless to say, this took some trial and error. Then I set up the fence and stop so I get the jig in the right place each time. I can't use my dust hose here because it will suck the dowels up if I give it half a chance. I had to hold the dowel a little with my fingers so it didn't come out of the hole when I raised the bit. This might bother some of you, but honestly, the bit's so small and with the fence and stop, it really wasn't a worry for me. But as I always say, your safety is your responsibility, so do whatever you need to to keep safe. Now I need to hammer the nails into the dowels, and I need some way of supporting the dowel as I do it. So I took some scrap wood and cut a shallow hole the same diameter as the dowel. Then I drilled the rest of the way through with a narrower bit, so the dowel has a ledge to rest on, yet there's still room for the nails to go through. I wanted to soften the sharp edges some, and give the bases a light sanding with some fine grit sandpaper, but it took me a while to figure out the easiest way to do it. I ended up using a sanding drum with a 220 grit sleeve on it for all the sharp edges. I didn't press very hard, just enough to take some of the edge off. Then I used some 220 grit, or maybe it was 320 grit, to do a quick once over to everything else. I got this one inch branding iron from a company called High Heat Stamp on Amazon. As with everything, there's links in the description below. The Amazon order page has this customize button, and when you click it, it asks you to upload your image. I got the stamp very quickly, in less than a week, and they gave me exactly what I asked for. You can buy branding irons that are electric, but they're expensive. This one has to be heated up, and I'm using this propane torch. The branding iron needs to be right about here. So I built this little jig out of scrap wood to hold it for me. It's in there good and solid. I use a wooden clamp to hold it. I built this little box to make it easy to get the brand in the right place. Originally, I was going to do the branding after I put the dowel in, so that's why there's a hole in the back, but it's not needed anymore. You put the body under the box, and the front edge here hangs over a little to help keep the body in place. The branding iron is actually 1 and 1 16th of an inch square, so it's just a little wider than the body. So I shaved off a little from the sides so the iron can get down to the body. Here's the blueprints. Again, these are available for free on my website. You can see I've already branded some of the pieces. 
I've got this spray bottle with a formula that's supposed to help the branding process. Later on I discovered it wasn't really helping, and I stopped using it. I hadn't realized how much hotter the iron had gotten while I turned on the camera, and ended up burning the next one. Whoa. By the way, it took about 5 minutes to get the iron good and hot. Notice how I'm pressing down here? This is a piece of plywood that I put on my workbench to make a larger work area. I had a nightmare vision of the plywood hanging over the edge here, and when I pressed down, the board would flip and send the torch flying, either at me or into the pile of scrap wood behind me. Needless to say, I was very careful here. <laughs> I'm not sure how close my hair was to the flame here, but I kept checking to make sure I wasn't too close. Don't know why I didn't take pictures of them when I was done. Probably because I was burned out. Before gluing the dowels into the bases, I'm using a rotary tool to scrape out any stray pieces of wood left over from the drilling. For the glue up, I'm using Type On 2, which is approved for indirect food contact. I don't expect the glue to come in contact with food at all, but it's good to be safe. My friend Matt from Next Level Carpentry suggested I use CA glue with activator, but I don't have any, so I decided to go with this instead. Sorry, Matt. How much should I use? How well will it hold up over time? I have absolutely no clue. So I just squirted some in each hole and pushed the dowels in. I wouldn't be surprised if one or two of the dowels managed to work their way out over time, but honestly, I'm not too worried. If I was selling the skewers, I'd feel differently, but these are gifts to friends and relatives, so I think they'll cut me some slack if they fall apart. I haven't done a lot of finishing work, but I do know how to watch YouTube videos, and I learned enough to take a stab at applying a finish to the skewers. And in the end, they turned out pretty well, in spite of my inexperience. I'm using the salad bowl finish from General Finishes. It was recommended by a few people, and that was good enough for me. I just dipped each skewer into the finish, then wiped off the excess. I'm not using gloves here, but after I put on the first coat, I went out and got some gloves. This stuff can be pretty sticky. I'm going to put on three coats about 30 minutes apart, then I'll wait about five hours before doing a light sanding and putting on the final coat. These styrofoam blocks worked okay, but if I got too much of the salad bowl finish on the nails, some of the styrofoam would stick to the nails, and it's not easy to remove. So you might want to find something better than styrofoam. I'll give that 30 minutes to dry. For the second coat, I tried a brush, but it's just as messy as dipping the pieces, so I went back to dipping. After this coat, I'll be doing a light sanding, so I don't wipe the excess off. But I'd rather not have too much excess, so I'm using a brush this time. I'm setting them aside for about 5 hours. Okay, it's been about 5 hours, so now I'm using 320 grit sandpaper to smooth the surfaces down. I'm not pressing hard at all, and I'm only running it back and forth a few times for each face. Don't get carried away here, it only takes a little to remove the roughness. After sanding all the pieces, I'm using a tack cloth to remove any remaining dust. Tack cloths have loose weaves, and they're sticky, so they're ideal for removing tiny particles. Time for the final coat. I tried a brush, but it puts too much on. I only want a light coat this time. So I used a cloth that was dust and lint-free to apply the finish. I'd like to say thank you to a couple of people on Instagram who offered suggestions for how to apply the finish. It was great to get feedback and help so quickly. So, thanks guys! It's the next day, and here's what they look like. I have to admit, they look pretty darn good. They're not perfect, but for a first try, I'm thrilled with the results. I'll let them sit for maybe as long as 72 hours to cure. Then we can wash them and start packaging them up. I wonder how long it'll take people to figure out what they are. Well, people who haven't watched this video anyway. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something from it. If so, please give it a thumbs up and consider leaving a comment. Check out the description for links to products seen in this video. Just scroll down, click Show More, and scroll down until you see the links. And if you like what I do here, click that Subscribe button. And don't forget to ring that bell to get notified about new videos. Thanks!